All right, so on Friday, we started discussing biotechnology and biotechnics. We took an opportunity to watch a couple of instruction, instructional videos to sort of orient us to this idea of the use of animals and animal products for uh, our benefit, essentially. Um, as you saw, there are numerous applications of the use of animals and animal products in our day-to-day -day lives from food production, medicine, and so forth. And so we'll continue that conversation today. Um, uh, as I said before, we, we mentioned that knowledge in microbiology is growing exponentially through the determination of genomic sequences in hundreds of different microorganisms. And so our ability to continue to investigate, we're using many different uh, applications, uh, particularly uh, computer analysis and gen gen genetic analysis are allowing us to uh, further our information or our knowledge if you will, by being able to sequence microorganisms, all right? So diving in, understanding their genetic makeup allows us to further understand gene products that are made, functions of genes, and so forth. And so that's one of the things that we want to uh, continue looking at today. We defined uh, biotechnology as the use of living organisms or their products to do one of two things, either improve human health, right? or to be able to perform industrial and manufacturing processes, right? So improving human health, we talked about the uh, formation of vaccines and so forth. We talked about uh, the manufacturing of food and beverage products and different manufacturing processes. And so this conversation is, is sort of, um, it, it, it's, it's a multi-dimensional conversation as we get on into synthetic biology and the ability to, uh, synthesize and create new products and so forth from the use of um, microorganisms and their uh, byproducts, all right? And so we want you to um, consider, you know, as you continue to matriculate through your program, that these things that you're learning on a theoretical level, we take that information and we try to uh, utilize it for real world applications, right? And so, you know, we use the word science a lot, but there's a such thing as a basic science and then there's applied science, right? So as a researcher, you will, you know, determine, you know, if you're interested in continuing in research, uh, I know a lot of you want to go into medicine and so forth, but as a researcher, we have to decide if we're interested in uh, basic science or applied science, right? As a basic scientist researcher, I'm a basic scientist, a basic science researcher. And what we do is we continue to um, conduct research, conduct investigations, experimentations to provide knowledge or add knowledge, add to a, a growing body of knowledge about a particular topic that interests us, right? So for example, I do research in the area of food safety and the prevention of foodborne illnesses. So as a basic science researcher, I'm just continuing to conduct research. I'm doing my experiments, I'm asking questions, I'm finding out great information, I'm publishing my papers. And so what I'm doing is I'm adding to a growing body of knowledge, right? That's what we call basic science, right? And then there's what we call applied science, right? Applied science gets into the business of now trying to uh, take what we've learned from a basic science standpoint and create some type of real world application from now what we know, right, from a basic science standpoint. So applied science is, is busy trying to create and use the information that we've uh, generated in the lab from a basic science standpoint and create some type of real world application, okay? Some type of a device, some type of a system, um, many different, uh, avenues that you can go. All right. So this applied science can be, uh, utilized over in engineering to try and again, create this awesome product that solves some type of a problem that we have, right. That individuals be willing, would be willing to, uh, invest in and pay a premium for, um, based on some systems and information we found out from a biological standpoint. Um, these uh, applied sciences obviously can uh, transcend down into medicine as we're creating uh, 
things like prosthetics, new devices, pacemakers, things that are going to uh, solve some type of a problem that we have from a human health standpoint, right? So biotechnology is a very multidimensional uh, field of science, okay? It's definitely one that's budding right now. Anything that has to do with biotech would certainly land you a great uh, career opportunity, all right? So again, from a point of definition here, and again, this, <coughs> excuse me, this is a very broad, definition, we want you to say that biotechnology involves the use of organisms or their products to either improve hum human health or to perform industrial and manufacturing processes, right? So we talked about some of these uh, biotechnology applications on last week um, from food production, right? We looked at wine where we're using uh, fermentation processes, exploiting properties of yeast in order to um, produce wine. We talked about cheese and other dairy products that are also created from the use of microorganisms, um, the process of fermentation that we have with bacteria also. We talked about applications in medicine, particularly vaccine productions. All right. We talked about these recombinant uh, synthetic vaccines that are using components of the virus for um, production. So for example, the current uh, COVID vaccines with Moderna has taken this new approach of using um, uh, RNA, it's an RNA vaccine. So not, not the typical, uh, like back before the advancements in technology, we used to generate viruses by um, attenuation, right? Where we're using these weight weakened um, viral products for um, priming, right? But now we have advanced in technology and we're able to generate sort of these recombinant synthetic vaccines that are a lot less risky, a lot less potential for harm, for harming, but we got these RNA, right? And you remember the, you remember in biology 103, you learned about the central dogma, uh, which tells us how information is transferred from DNA to RNA to protein. And so we know that that RNA is this intermediate molecule that uh, is created prior to translation and creation of those protein products. And so the Moderna vaccine is an uh, RNA vaccine that is going to generate components of the virus that will uh, that your immune system will recognize in an effort to prime, okay? Um, in order to get that immune response, right? So there's no uh, true viral particles being injected into your body. Um, it's, again, it's just a, a more uh, sophisticated method of, of priming your immune system to produce that immune response so that if you are ever exposed to uh, coronavirus, you have a uh, less your chances of becoming significantly to having significant complications from the exposure to coronavirus is reduced significantly if you're already primed. That's kind of how our immune system works, right? Um, it, uh, vaccines are basically exposing you to uh, the virus or components of the virus in order to, prov to prime your immune system at a lower, um, to a lower extent, extent if you will. And such that when you come in contact with it, it will recognize those antigens and be able to mount a an immune response a lot faster um, so that your chances of being sick are significantly reduced, All right? So biotech applications in medicine are pretty much endless. I mean, that's the goal here is to improve human health, prevent disease, and so forth, All right? So vaccines are certainly at the top of that list. Um, we also talked a little bit about uh, uh, agriculture, hy hybrid crops, um, the use of GMOs, right? We talked about this notion that a lot of people tend to frown upon GMOs, but their, their use are justified, if you will, where we're not out here trying to create like all these different foreign things that will ultimately create havoc for us, but what we're trying to do is improve human health, right? So the use of genetically modified organisms are, are only for our good, right? And we did sort of highlight 
mm, that we have to think about the potential negative fallouts, right, from all of our new inventions. Yeah, there's a risk for, you know, things like biological warfare, but we we can't um, we can't let that thought uh, paralyze us and prevent us from continuing to make the awesome advances that we are um, with biotechnology. All right, so. I wanted to just take a minute today and run through a few sort of uh, notable uh, techniques that we're using and advanced in science with right now. Uh, one biotechnique is genetic analysis. And I do want you to write this information down. We'll, we'll ask you about it later. So genetic analysis is kind of at the forefront of research right now. Um, and what it involves is the identification and manipulation of genes, right? So we know that all living things, all organisms have a genome, right? Your genome is your entire set of genes, like your genetic makeup, your DNA, right? And it is these genes, right? Your genome, an organism's genome determines its function, right? And so we are busy investigating organisms from a genetic standpoint, okay? Genetic analysis. We're trying to identify the genome and we're trying to manipulate it in order to better understand things, right? So one of the most uh, prominent investigations uh, with genetic analysis from a human standpoint was the Human Genome Project, right? You've heard about the Human Genome Project before, but this, uh, Human Genome Project was our attempt to uh, map the human genome, right? And, you know, map the genes across these chromosomes and understand what their functions are, okay? That was a major, uh, like a, a international uh, undertaking from scientists or researchers all across the globe that were working to determine what the human genome sequence was and what the functions of these genes were. So anyway, we'll come back to that in a second. But so genetic analysis, the goal here is for us to uh, identify in an organism the genes that are present. And then we, we further investigate the functions of these genes, if you will, by some type of a manipulation, right? We can knock out the gene, silence them, do different things in order to study their function, right? So one of the ways we do that is by mutations, right? We can introduce a mutation and into a gene in an organism and then observe the effects of those mutations on further, you know, cellular behavior, right? So again, we know the, the, the order of, 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 of existence in terms of DNA being the genetic code for synthesizing RNA, and then that mRNA is used to generate proteins. And so we know that proteins then are the functional units of the cell. We've talked about that, right? So our proteins are our functional products in our cells. And so if we can alter the sequence that is used to make these proteins, we can then further study downstream effects of these uh, mutations, all right? That is a very uh, basic experiment that we do in order to study gene function, all right? We introduce mutations and observe the downstream effects of, of these mutations in our organisms, all right? And depending on your area of research, your model system can be anything from bacteria, to mice, rabbits, you know, we use a number of model organisms for the investigation uh, of information that we can want, probably uh, extrapolate to humans, okay? Um, I did, I spent quite a lot of my early years in science working with mice, right? Um, and believe it or not, though, they're, they're physically quite different than humans. Mice have a very high sequence homology to humans. I, I, I think the number was somewhere between 80 to 90% gene homology, right? And so these mice, unfortunately, are a great um, uh, system, if you will, for studying 
genes, okay, genetic analysis for, for, for us to be able to uh, correlate it with human functions. They're small, they don't require a lot, they re reproduce quickly, they're inexpensive, their diet is not expensive. And so uh, cultivating these mice for research purposes are quite uh, efficient. They're economical and all of the above, right? And, and so again, there's, there's this, I, I forget the percentage of, of uh, gene homology or conservation from human to mice, but it's quite high. And so we use mice a lot for our research purposes, cancer research and so forth to investigate the effects of drugs, chemotherapies and, and any other questions that we may have. Um, uh, so, so gene mutations are, are one way. It's something that we've been doing for quite a while now, and it's gotten us quite far in terms of how we are able to investigate gene function and take that information for a more um, applied response, okay? Um, another tool that we use in genetic analysis is gene annotations. Okay, jot this down. Gene annotations are becoming more and more uh, popular, all right, for us to study the, or learn the potential functions of a protein, all right? And so these gene annotations take place via a computer analysis, all right? So you probably see this word bioinformatics a lot. All right, this is, this is one component of bioinformatics where we're using uh, computer, tool, computer tools to computer programming to further investigate gene function, okay? Genes produce proteins, all right? If we can understand the types and functions of proteins that are produced by various genes, again, we're able to, to continue to have a leg up, all right? So gene annotations are super important. Um, they're becoming more and more prominent. They're helping us to advance our knowledge uh, a lot quicker than, you know, laboratory analyses. But it certainly requires, you know, uh, DNA sequencing and, and so forth, all right? Uh, gene annotations. Then we have what we call gene regulation, all right? We can study the regulation of genes by using what we call reporters, right? So again, we know how the information contained in organisms used from DNA to RNA to protein. And so we can manipulate these genes in order to study their uh, protein products by creating sort of these hybrids where we basically fuse the gene of interest. So, so if we're interested in, in this particular gene and what their protein products are, and how they function in the cell and the you know cellular location and so forth, we can fuse these genes uh, synthetically to a reporter, right? And this reporter is basically going to be a a gene that creates a protein product that we can easily sort of follow or assess. Okay, we kind of conduct an assay and we're looking for something, right? We report with. Um, like for example, LAC-Z, the LAC-Z gene produces uh, beta-gal, beta-galactosidase, all right? We can easily do an assay for the presence of beta-gal in our culture very easily, all right? We can also fuse these genes to uh, fluorescence uh, reporters, right? We know genes that produce, excuse me, fluorescent protein products. And so we can fuse our gene of interest to this reporter that will re result in the production of a uh, fluorescent protein, right? So uh, GFP is a reporter that is commonly utilized, right? So again, these applications can go on and on and on and on and on. But again, we as researchers, we, we commit ourselves to um, basic and applied science sciences in order to, you know, with the ultimate goal of being able to improve human health, improve industrial processes, manufacturing processes, and so forth, uh, via the use of uh, microorganisms. And so this is what biotechnology is all about, all right? So the Human Genome Project, this is one of the most 
classical uh, efforts, if you will, for us to uh, be able to continue to advance in biotech, all right? This was a very long process, very arduous task of mapping the human genome, all right? So the Human Genome Project took place over a number of years where scientists across the globe uh, worked to determine, you know, what was the sequence, what base pairs were found in the human DNA? What was the makeup of the human DNA, okay? So they set out to map all of the genes in the human genome from both a physical standpoint, if you will, and from a functional standpoint, all right? You cannot imagine what that task really entailed, right? You know, the human genome has over 20,000 genes, right? And so this, this project has been going on for decades, okay? We, we reached a level of what we call completeness uh, just recently, all right, where we are kind of confident that we have um, mapped the entire human genome. We know the genes that are present. We know what their functions are, all right? And again, this effort crossed many different disciplines of science, okay? Chemistry, bioinformatics, physics, ethics. There were a number of different considerations for the Human Genome Project, all right? <clears throat> and so now we, we have this information. Now, what are we going to do with it? We continue to use the information that uh, this project has provided for us as, as a map for continuing our um, explorations with biotech, okay? So the utility of this information is endless, okay? It is absolutely endless, all right? And what we do understand is that this isn't, is not a, this is kind of a, a fluid situation, if you will, right? Like we're all different. We all, for the most part, have the, have similar uh, genetic makeup, but of course there are deviations. We have genetic abnormalities and things that, you know, some individuals um, possess uh, the, the various alleles and their functions are a little bit different. But in totality, this, this, this project provides a, a roadmap, a mosaic, if you will, of the genes that are likely present in an individual and what their functions are, okay? Um, and so for the most part, you know, these genes are all the same, but of course, individuals can experience uh, deviations from the norm, abnormalities, you know, you see mutations and, and that's where we get our uh, diseases and syndromes and so forth. And so anyway, I definitely encourage you to go out and just kind of peek around on the web about the Human Genome Project. It's quite fascinating. Um, and we have completely mapped the human genome. It's pretty awesome. So uh, one of the uh, techniques at the forefront of biotech is DNA sequencing, okay? Everything starts with DNA, right? And so uh, by definition, DNA sequence is basically the process of determining the nucleic acid sequence, the order of nucleotides in a particular set of DNA, right? Jot that down. DNA sequencing is certainly at the forefront of um, biotech, right? All organisms have uh, genetic material, right? So we've got to sequence this DNA before we can do anything else, all right? Different methods of sequencing here, and it's basically just a laboratory experiment that will allow us to delineate the sequence of nucleotides in a DNA, right? You know, we've got A, T, Gs, and Cs. We know the structure of DNA is this double helical structure where we've got these uh, nucleic acids uh, 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 binding together with these hydrogen bonds in the middle. We got these phosphodiester bonds on the um, sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA molecule. And every individual has a unique combination of um, nucleotides. And so we start there, right? DNA sequencing at the forefront. Jot that down.
Okay. So DNA sequencing is a very important um, sort of first step in genome analysis. All right. Let's look at this quick video for DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing is the process of working out the order of the building blocks or bases in a strand of DNA. Before we can sequence the DNA, it has to be cut up into smaller pieces that are inserted into plasmid DNA and then put into bacterial cells. This makes it possible to produce lots and lots of copies of it as the bacterial cells multiply. The DNA is then isolated from the bacteria and sent for sequencing. The isolated DNA is transferred to a plate where the sequencing reaction will take place. A mixture of ingredients is added. These include free DNA bases. A, C, G, T, DNA polymerase enzyme, and DNA primers. Modified DNA bases labeled with colored, fluorescent tags are also added. These are called terminator bases. To start the sequencing reaction, everything is heated to 96 degrees Celsius. This separates the DNA into two single strands. The temperature is then lowered to 50 degrees. This enables the DNA primers to bind to the plasmid DNA. The temperature is then increased to 60 degrees and the enzyme DNA polymerase binds to the primer DNA. DNA polymerase starts making a new strand of DNA by adding unlabeled DNA bases to the target DNA. It continues to add DNA bases until a terminator base is added. These terminator bases have been chemically altered so that no more bases can be added to the new strand of DNA. Once a terminator base is added, the DNA polymerase enzyme stops making DNA and falls away from the strand. Everything is then heated to 96 degrees Celsius again to separate the new DNA strand from the original strand. This process of heating and cooling is repeated again and again to produce lots of fragments of DNA of different lengths. The length of each fragment depends on when a terminator base got added. To read the sequence of the DNA, the various fragments are separated by length using a process called electrophoresis. A capillary tube is lowered into each well of the plate and an electrical charge is applied. This causes the negatively charged DNA molecules to move through the capillary tube. Each capillary contains a porous gel. The shorter fragments of DNA move through the gel more easily than the longer DNA fragments. As a result, the fragments become arranged by size from the shortest to the longest. As the DNA fragments come to the end of the capillary, a laser makes the terminator bases light up. The color is detected by a camera and recorded. Each terminator base is labeled with a different color. A, fluoresces green. C, blue. G, yellow and T, red. The shortest DNA fragments will be red first and the longest red last. 
The sequencing machine records the color of the terminator bases as a series of colored blocks. Each colored block represents the labeled terminator base at the end of each fragment of DNA. By converting the colors into letters, we get the sequence of our piece of DNA. All right, so, all right. And so that's DNA sequencing. It's obviously a very... Um, People are streaming more of what they love with Windows 11 and Intel. I like to watch movies, documentaries. Windows 11 is giving us things. It's a very uh, common laboratory uh, exercise that we can, you know, easily do in order to figure out the uh, DNA sequence of a sample. Get my slide back up here. All right. So another uh, biotechnique that's becoming increasingly common in labs are uh, it's called a northern blot. Jot that down. This northern blot technique is a technique to analyze RNA. OK, we want to analyze the presence, size and, you know, specifics of an RNA molecule. Right. And so basically we have to, you know, do the RNA extraction process. RNA is extracted and separated by size uh, using gel electrophoresis. So it's a very common uh, technique that's utilized and it has many different applications depending on the question that you are trying to answer. All right. Um, again, we have the sample. We have to extract RNA exclusively, right? Once we've extracted RNA from our sample, we separate it via gel electrophoresis. And it's basically where we're using this uh, semi solid uh, uh, gel, if you will. It's got the, like, these pores in it, and it's going to uh, cause this RNA to fractionate or separate by size as it moves through this gel. We're basically going to apply an electrical current to it. And it's going to cause that sample to move and migrate through the gel. And then we will ultimately um, visualize the result and look at these bands and look for band patterns and comparing it to our um, DNA ladder or RNA uh, ladder that we're looking at for size. Uh, I you guys are in microbiology. I don't know if you've taken uh, cell biology yet, but one of the things you should definitely be doing in your cell biology lab is learning about the process of gel electrophoresis and how you can separate uh, samples uh, based on size using an electrical field, okay? Um, and so this, this is the northern blot, all right? The northern blot can also be compared to the southern blot and the western blot. The, so the northern, jot these down real quick so that you can read about them on your own time. The northern blot assesses, northern blot assesses RNA. Southern blot assesses DNA. And then western blots assess protein. Okay, so separate them by size you know, run them on a gel and kind of, you know, again, depending on what question we're uh, trying to answer for our particular experiment, we can extrapolate from that. All right. So the Western blot, I wanted to highlight this one real quick. The Western blot is one of the most common, commonly used techniques in the lab. All right. The Western blot is a method to detect specific protein products in a sample. Right. And so again, this protein has to be extracted from whatever our sample source is, whatever the mixture is, we want to ex extract just the protein, right, for this analysis. And this protein, again, is uh, separated by size, right? And so we're going to separate this protein by size. We're going to transfer it to this membrane. And then we're essentially going to add a, an antibody, all right? We're going to add an antibody that's going to allow for the specific identification of the protein. We use this primary antibody, and then depending on what the source of the protein is, we may use a secondary antibody. But in the end, the transfer of this uh, 
protein right to these membranes and then the use we're washing it with these primary and or secondary antibodies and then we go and visualize it all right in order to see this band pattern again this band pattern is what we're looking for here and so when we're saying we're separating it by size we're running in that first lane what we call a standard right this marker here in lane one has um a a, a mixture of known sizes right and depending on where your unknown sample aligns we can identify the presence of proteins that may be in our mixture okay based on the size all right the molecular weight and, and it's usually in kilodaltons for proteins all right and so again this is a very old and useful tool it's very very common we do a western blot again depending on what question you're trying to answer i mean it's used for disease diagnosis i mean you name it this is a very um frequently utilized technique in microbiology cell biology uh, pretty much across many different disciplines no matter what your area of specialty is the western blot is sort of a critical tool in your lab right again because protein function is 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 one of the um uh, hallmarks of cellular activity genetic analysis you know we're looking at proteins these are functional products in our cells so biotech does not exist without the use of the western blot all right <clears throat> jot that down i will ask you questions later about the western blot technique all right, I think we have one more video with the Western blot, and then we have some concept review questions. Let's Western blot. Hi, and welcome to my video series of Biotechnics Explained in Five Minutes, where I explain the concept in biology in less than five minutes. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please hit that subscribe button. Today's installment, we'll be talking about Western blot. The Western blot is a technique which would allow us to detect our protein of interest in a pool of protein. Now, nowadays, it is like widely used as a diagnostic tool in many infectious disease, which we will be talking about. And Disease like HIV might be diagnosed using Western blot. So Western blot has immense importance. And in fundamental research, Western blot is also very important. So we would discuss all these aspects in this video. So let's start how the Western blot works. So in Western blot, you have to take your cell lysate or protein extract or bacterial extract, anything from where you want to get the protein source. So you have to separate the protein along the molecular weight in a SDS page gel. So the first degree separation is doing SDS page. And in this situation, you separate the proteins according to their molecular weight. So there would be different, different bands from the protein sample. Now your proteins must be lying in these, one of these bands, right? Now, this is how I exact gel look like in case of uh, after STS page running and stained with Kumasi blue. Now the second part of Western blot is to transfer these uh, proteins into a PVDF membrane. So such that you can detect your protein of interest. Let's say you have only a gel and in the gel, you know roughly around 75 KB you have your protein of interest. But the problem is even if your protein is like 75 KD, you know that you never know what other proteins are of 75 KD present in that particular sample. So there could be many different proteins which are of molecular weight 75 KD and present in the sample. So without doing a Western blot, you cannot tell whether your protein of interest is present just on basis of the band size. So what you do in Western blot, you take the gel and for example, this is your, you know, this is the band of your interest, but it might be some other proteins as well. So what you do is like you put it in a transfer apparatus where you put the SDS gel and on top of it you put a PVDF membrane and you transfer either by chemically or by electrical field. So most popular is electrical field or electrobot blood these days. So as a result, what would happen? The proteins that are now on the gel would be eventually transferred and be on the membrane. 
So now once we have all the proteins in the membrane, we can start to detect our protein of interest by antibody specific manner. So we need an antibody which can detect our protein of interest. And we have to understand that that antibody is monoclonal and it's non, not specific to any other protein. It is very specific to the, my protein of interest. Now on the membrane, there would be several protein bands and several proteins, right? So all of these proteins are present in the lysate that we have taken. Now we have to detect the protein of our interest. That is this particular protein where the antibody is binding. So we would only get a band in that region. So once the antibody binds, we can use several colorimetric, chemiluminescence or fluorescence based method to detect the particular protein of interest. And most popular way of detection these days are chemiluminescence. Now, Western blot could be used for diagnosis of several diseases. One big example is AIDS. So let's just take a look how it works. So for example, we suspect a patient is uh, infected by HIV virus. So we take the blood sample of that patient, we extract the proteins and we run it onto a gel. Now, after that, we, after running the gel, we take the gel, we blot it and try to detect that our suspected antigen is present or not. For HIV, there are known biomarkers like, for example, GP120 is one of the suspected antigen that has to be present if the um, patient is infected by HIV. So we have to blot against that particular protein. And if we see a positive band, that means the patient is infected. So for example, HIV virus has GP120 and GP120, again, GP120, we could have specific antibodies. Now we can detect that specific antibodies in any of chemical luminescent or colorimetric way. And that would give us distinct band. If we get a band, that means the patient is affected. If we don't get a band, the test is negative. Now, not only in diagnosis or medical usage, Western blot is widely used for studying fundamental scientific research. So in basic cell signaling could be studied by Western blot. For example, let's say, imagine a receptor is activated once the ligand is bound and there are a cascade of events. And most important event is phosphorylation of these blue protein. So once the phosphorylation of the blue protein takes place, then other nuclear events and downstream event can take place. So this is a crucial event, let's say. So these days we have antibodies specific to the unphosphorylated protein versus the phosphorylated epitope. So the phosphoepitope antibody allows us to understand how much phosphorylation has taken place. And the degree of phosphorylation would in turn tell us about the status of the signaling. So in the plot, if we get two bands corresponding to one to the phosphoepitope and one to the normal epitope, then we might say, the signaling has turned on or turned off. So based on the situation of the phosphorylation, we can understand the signaling is turned on or turned off, right? All right, so we'll stop right here. We kind of ran out of time today. Um, so, so again,